this will show you in comparison. Look at Mount St. Helens and that little dot right there. And Mount St. Helens was was a pretty big explosion. I was in uh, Mount St. Helens back in 2011. Was it 2011? No, it was before that. It was a few years before that. It was 2008 because I used to live in the Northwest and I used to go mountain biking all the time. And I went out in Mount St. Helens and the where the volcano is interesting because on one side of the mountain, it was just complete, completely obliterated. And then the other side, you know, you've got all these beautiful trees that didn't get affected as much or at all by, well, I shouldn't say at all, but didn't get affected. They look great. They're beautiful by the magma and lava that was released. That was a pretty big deal. And it could go off again because it's an active volcano. But look at the small plume in comparison to what would happen if Yellowstone was to erupt. So when you've got stories coming out and shatter whistleblowers saying that the powers that be, those shadow agencies, are planning on detonating an explosion around the region where there's mass amounts of lava, the caldera there, It really makes you wonder. Now, let's take a look at this right here. So, first of all, this is what I find interesting. This is directly from USGS.gov, gov, gum. <laughs> from 1,000 to 3,000 earthquakes typically occur each year within Yellowstone National Park. So, we've already exceeded the 1,000 quakes in just a couple of weeks, a little over a couple of weeks. Now, if we scroll up here, this will give you an idea. Recent seismic activity in the Yellowstone region over the past couple million years. And you see these outlines here. So look at the boundaries of the older calderas. And there's been articles that have came out recently that say there's more lava under there than originally thought. A lot more. And then you go here, let's take a look at this right here. This will show you, let me zoom in on this a little bit. If you look at some prehistoric eruptions, you know, a couple million years ago, about a million years ago, compared to what's happened here in the 21st century, 20th century, I'm sorry, the 19th century. And this is also interesting because it's very minute in comparison. So we haven't really seen obliteration like the ancients did yet. Here's another one right here. This is the volume of erupted volcanic ash. So you can look at Yellowstone here. 585 miles to the third power 2.1 million years ago. Long Valley, Mount St. Helens, 0 0.1 versus 585. Look at that, 0 0.1 versus 585. To put that in comparison, Mount St. Helens versus Yellowstone. This is directly from volcanoes.usgs.gov. You can see that over the past 30 days, Past 30 days, 1,114 earthquakes. 1,114 earthquakes in 30 days. So it's literally exceeded the yearly average in just a matter of a few weeks. And there's absolutely nothing to worry about, according to the mainstream news. Now, when the mainstream news says there's nothing to worry about, that's when I think you need to worry about it. When they say there's something to worry about, it's usually there's not. Now, not always, but it seems like they just like to play these little mind games with us. You're like, oh, these, watch these little cockroaches squirm. <laughs> We're the elites. They're just the cockroaches. No, it's the other way around. Right here, earthquakes from 1,000 to 3,000 earthquakes typically occur each year within Yellowstone National Park and its immediate surroundings. So, you go up here. You can look at the data once again. This is directly from USGS.gov. 
This is from truthernews.files. This is where I found this article where supposedly a whistleblower came out and said, the powers that be are planning to ignite Yellowstone with a nuclear type weapon. And this will show you that it's supposed to happen August 21st, 2021. You can see the amount of ash in feet, according to these docs right here. Now, this is a lot more than the other docs that I was sharing with you guys. I mean, it's saying 6 to 10 feet. In places, panhandle around, or panhandle around Texas. Parts of Idaho, obviously Montana. Jeez. And it's saying 13 feet. So these, these are way off compared to the ones that I was sharing with you guys. I don't know where they got this data. Zero to 11 inches. As far down as San Antonio, all the way down to looks like Corpus Christi almost in Texas. That's the beach. Could you imagine if that much ash covered the planet or covered the country? That makes me think of the Deagle reports. Do you guys remember the Deagle reports that came out? That's a think tank, and they are an independent think tank. And they came out with some calculations about how many people are going to be in the U.S. in, I think it was like 20, uh, 2027. And they were calculating, what, 29 million, 27 million, something like that. Now, here's another thing I think about. If you guys look at the amount of magma and lava that flows underneath us, it, it puts the land mass, it's Pell in comparison. And I wonder, with all these nuclear reactors, these you know 449-plus nuclear reactors, and there's about 100 in the U.S., well, let's just say that all of a sudden this huge split opens up in the earth and it just sucks down, literally it just like eats those nuclear reactors. Then what happens? Then is that better than all of the nuclear stuff going out into the atmosphere? It gets swallowed up by the, by the earth? Deagle's a great site, and they actually did a, a rebuttal, or they had a, not a rebuttal, but they talked about that report because it caused a whole bunch of chatter, and some people speculated it was from the Ebola virus, and they didn't even use those calculations. And we're getting some serious issues here with the internet stream guys so thank you for bearing with me here i'll make sure to upload this as well because i am recording this you guys won't have to deal with the internet issues the internet gremlins so stay with me folks looks like it's come stream complete no we're still streaming this is bizarre it's funny how everything's fine when i'm on the road then i get back and i start doing these shows and immediately start having internet issues almost every single time it doesn't fail I need my own internet service because this is ridiculous. So, six to ten feet of ash, you guys, as far down as Arizona, like almost to the border of Mexico. This could take out literally almost the entire country if these reports are accurate. Now, what could you do? Well, you could go underground for a couple years, several months. And then come back out, have, I, I guess, I don't know, I'm, I'm speculating here, don't take my word for it, have respiratory gear, masks, everything you need to deal with that kind of stuff. You could have a concrete shelter somewhere and hopefully survive the, you know, the initial onslaught and then come out. And then you'd have to find a way to, you'd have to have seeds, you'd have to have a water supply, you'd have to have a way, a continual water source, filtration systems. Now, it's going to be tough to have solar power, I'll bet you. I don't know what solar power is going to be like. I mean, imagine what the sun's going to be like at that point. So you're going to have to find a way to create your own light source for a while, possibly. Maybe some type of fiber optic setup. Maybe you're going to need to have a place to where you can grow your own food inside. 
you know, some greenhouses, and then think about how much ash is going to land on the greenhouses. I mean, many of those would be destroyed. So you'd have to have some pretty solid facilities to withstand this. Now, if you're on the other side of the world, if you're in Canada, even I mean, even Canada gets nailed. Look at this. Canada goes, looks like ash goes. You got six to ten feet of ash going all the way into Canada, eh? The Minnesota. I mean, this is just complete devastation for the North American continent. I mean, this is this is way beyond anything that it showed on reports before that I was sharing with you guys. But you know what? I don't have the data on this. I mean, this could be easily just somebody's doom poon fantasy. Somebody could have just said, oh, you know, I think there's going to be 45 feet of ash because, you know, it just looks like it, and that's what I'm going to write down. So how do we know that this, I mean, or this could be a, a fear porn tactic by the powers that be. Say, oh, yeah, let's make everybody think that the entire U.S. is going to get wiped out with a super volcano. They're really good at manipulating things. And they're also really good at telling people about things that are going to happen before they do in cartoons. Literally, I was watching Family Guy for a few minutes the other day when I was on the road. I usually don't watch that show. But Family Guy, it's, it's, it's creepy when you think about the predictive programming in Family Guy and The Simpsons, these cartoons. It is literally creepy. Because they, they tell you in cartoons sometimes about what's going to happen. Or maybe it's just... Maybe it's just the psychic intellect of these writers. You know, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, they, they're just seeing it happen. It could be. It could be a combination of both. But isn't it bizarre how many things that have happened in real life, or at least it's portrayed in real life in the media, after it happens on The Simpsons or The Family Guy? And there's been a ton of stuff lately about Yellowstone and about these earthquakes around there. And maybe they're just trying to keep us freaked out. So that they know how easy you are to control when you're in that fear state. It's a fight or flight mode, more so, than creative mode. Or maybe they're like, oh, we told you. You didn't do anything about it. And I also find it interesting that that weird synchronicity, how I recently went out to New Mexico and explored all the volcanoes out there, and it just kind of happened. And then I had, an, I had an opportunity to see how much, how intense volcanoes really are. I mean, the aftermath. I, I remember... For miles and miles and miles and miles driving in New Mexico and looking at the volcanic rocks on each side of me. And it looked like a lot of them looked like they had just came up. You know, I mean, I was like, man, is there something going on under there right now? And I talked to the people at the fire and ice facility. It's a private land, but it's great. You guys should go check it out. It's about 4,000 acres. There's 29 volcanoes out there, 29 volcanoes. And I said, well, it looked like a lot of that volcanic rock was fresh it looked like it had just popped up from the from the ground and do you know anything about that and the one guy said no i don't know anything about it but then the other gal said yeah it's about two inches a year on average new you know like from coming from the ground lifting up and then you go back and it's also bizarre here's another synchronicity i want to get your opinions on when I really started researching the patents and getting deep into the technical data on the chemical trails and the stratospheric aerosol injections, I mean, I've known about them for, for years, I've known about them for over 10 years, but I really started reading the patents and the white papers and the docs several months ago and sharing that information with you guys. And I remember reading an article popped up that talked about how back in the biblical days, around 5,000 years ago, approximately, I can't remember the exact dates, but it was a long time ago in the BC time frame. The, the atmosphere changed, the environment changed because there were several volcanoes and the volcanoes changed the weather. And that's exactly what these stratospheric aerosol injections are doing. And then Zachariah Sitchin, you know what you guys could, for those of you that give Zachariah Sitchin a hard time, I, I listened to, I started listening to his, the 12th planet last night. That dude was brilliant. That dude was absolutely brilliant. And a lot of stuff, I haven't read all of his books or heard all of his stuff yet, but a lot of stuff that I listened to in that audiobook was correlating with what these Sumerian tablets via Oxford scholars have said. So you guys can love him or hate him, but I'll tell you, I got a lot more respect for that guy now, especially after listening to a lot of that book last night. And he, he's ve he was very, very intelligent. I also talked to somebody off the books about how he saw Sitchin live, and the guy talked for three hours straight on his chair, didn't pause, didn't stop, just dialed in. 
there's been plenty of people that have translated Sumerian cuneiform tablets that have came to very similar conclusions as Sitchin, except for Nibiru. Now, with that said, I think that this Trappist-1 system that I shared with you guys might actually be where these Sumerians or these Anunnaki that the Sumerians talked about come from. But that's a whole other podcast. I'm just connecting the dots here on the volcanoes and how Sitchin said that the Anunnaki were attempting to ignite, were, were igniting nukes in calderas to cause volcanoes to change the atmosphere. That didn't work. So then they started terraforming the atmosphere. Well, look at what we're doing, guys. We're terraforming the atmosphere. Now let's go back to the film Star Trek. This, the first blockbuster of the new series that came out. Thought it was brilliant, by the way. It was either the first or second one. And do you remember it starts off and they're on the planet Nibiru? They're on the planet Nibiru. And guess what? This is where the PSYOP is. The planet Nibiru, do you remember the... They were attempting to stop a volcano on Nibiru, Spock was. Because if that volcano would have erupted, it would have blown up the planet. It would have destroyed the planet. So Spock was willing to sacrifice himself to stop the volcano. Live long and prosper, Spock. Love you, man. You're awesome. He stops the volcano. And then remember Kirk. Kirk's awesome in the film also. Captain Kirk. Captain Kirk. The, the new series is great. They... They're running, okay, so they're running, and they're getting shot at with arrows and stuff by these tribal people on Nibiru. They get in the ship, they get away, and then all of a sudden, the tribal people on Nibiru, they think that, that that's their new god. They see the ship, they write, you know, they, they draw the ship on the ground, they start worshiping it, that's their new god. Well, guess what? I think Nibiru, <laughs> what if Nibiru, I'm thinking of it the opposite. Nibiru, the people that were there, were not primitive like that. They were very intelligent, like the Sumerians talk about. And they also had their issues as well. <laughs> you know, they, they, like their, they like to drink and they like to manipulate beings to do the work for them. And they like to go space travel. What's wrong with that? I'm joking. But that's the way they looked at it. What if Nibiru, obviously, in my opinion here, if, if the Sumerian archetype, of the Anunnaki coming from Nibiru, you would think that the people on Nibiru would be extremely advanced. And it would be the opposite. It's like they're showing us what happened on Earth thousands of years ago when tri original Earthlings had evolved in their own natural fashion that weren't this... They weren't as... I don't want to use the, the term intellectual because in some ways they were far above and beyond on a spiritual level and, and a soul level, but as far as the mental applications of building things to either blow stuff up or to, you know, uh, uh, incredible, brilliant inventions, it's like you've got both there. They talked about, you know, they, they would see something, they would see these beings come down from the skies and they would write about them, they would draw them, they would, they would paint them, they would mimic them. So this is the kind of stuff that goes on in the media where they will throw it in your face but they'll spin it a little bit. They'll, they'll tell you bits and pieces of truth, but they'll do the exact opposite on the reference of the specific person or archetype. You know, they'll paint a picture of an archetype being good when maybe that archetype is bad. But they'll show you how the story unfolds in their, on their side, their perception that they want you to look at, that they want you to absorb, that they want you to assimilate to. And they stopped that volcano from destroying the planet. Well, where did they get, get that information from? You know, did they just, did they steal it from the Sumerian stuff? You know, they like, oh, this is where they got it and they added it to the movies because we know that Hollywood is full of Department of Defense help. And you can read about this stuff. Let's say you're making a movie or a TV show and you need a bunch of submarines or you need a, uh, you know, some, a couple of F-17s or maybe you need a couple tanks or something. Well, the, the Department of Defense, they'll be more than happy to help you out, but you better add something to that script. You better paint the right picture that they want you to, to pitch their agenda. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's the way that it is. So if you're aware of that kind of stuff, then you can know how they're conditioning you. I mean, you watch some of these movies on terror where they, they paint the picture of these 
extremists, you know, being the bad guys, and, and they're going to come and, oh, well, that guy needs to be white. He needs to be waterboarded because he's an evil terrorist. But that that's, once again, a whole other episode, but you get my point on the conditioning, how the powers that be will use certain archetypes and subliminal programming to get you to think your neighbor or that guy that lives around the world is the bad guy. And here's another thing that I find fascinating, you guys, is... What is the next war going to be like? The next world war. There's been proxy wars going on now for a long time. But when you got global war going on, are all the players at the top levels working together to come to the same goal, except for maybe they've got their own agendas as well, but they have to follow certain rules and orders? Or will there be somebody that comes out of the woodwork that takes over a specific nation, whether it's a third world nation or you know, something much more? as far as industrialized. Will they just not follow the rules and just do whatever it takes? Because it seems like there's these hierarchical orders where even though there's weapons of mass destruction around the world, there's 449 nuclear reactors that we know about, there is a ton of doom and gloom. I mean, there's, there's millions of fracking sites, yet we're still here. Some of us, thankfully, are still healthy. Some of us have the, the right ideas and mindset, even though all this nastiness is going on around us. But you can certainly see the polarities. But we're still here. And wouldn't you think that something would have happened previously? Or maybe something did happen. And that's why many are discussing the very real possibility we could be in some type of simulated matrix or reality right now. And I think to myself, well, would that explain why we see... Some days when we look up at the, for example, go back in your mind, folks, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and you're taking a road trip. Let's say you're taking a road trip and you're going through Colorado, or you're going through Arizona, or you're going through Utah, or you're going through New Mexico, or you're going through Wyoming. Remember how you could see the horizon? Remember how you could actually see the mountains? Not just the outline, but you could actually see details of the mountains. Now... What's it like when you look out at the horizon? When you look out at these mountain ridges, mountain ridges after mountain ridge after mountain ridge, what is it like? You can't even, it's like this weird haze. A lot of times, all you can see is the outlines of the mountains. Even if you're in an area where there's virtually no pollution, it's still there. Why? Well, back in 2011, when I took that 3,500 mile motorcycle trip in seven days on my dual sport BMW, that was awesome, but it was also sore. I remember driving through the Canyonlands, driving through Arizona, this place called Canyon de Chalet, driving through New Mexico, and driving through, uh, what was it, Wyoming on the way back. I drove all the way up, all through Utah, and I did this awesome round trip deal. I would stop at these parks like the Canyonlands, and it was so hazy and overcast and yucky. And I remember talking to these people there. I said, you see that? And they're like, yeah, what do you think it is? I said, that's from the chemtrails. And they said, yeah, well, and these were older people. And very nice, very down to earth. And they said they were talking to the people that worked at the park. And the people at the park were like, yeah, we've never seen anything like this either. This has got to be from all the wildfires. Yet, at that particular time, wildfires weren't in the area. They had nothing to do with it. It's the same thing now. It's the same thing it was last year. It's the same thing it was the year before that. When was the last time you actually saw a beautiful blue sky all the way to the end of the horizon? You can't even see the end of the horizon anymore. It's like this weird haze. I remember driving home yesterday and looking at the, the clouds. Do you remember when clouds used to like move? Like all the clouds, you would see clouds, they would actually move in a beautiful fashion. It's very rare that I see real clouds anymore, folks. When I say real clouds, I'm talking about clouds that were created by nature, not by stratospheric aerosol injections, by dumping chemicals into the atmosphere. I was looking at these streaks of these clouds. And you know what? They, they just sit there. They don't even move. They just sit there, stagnant. It's disgusting. And then I remember seeing above, I've got video footage of this. I'll share this video footage with you, of this planet. I'm 99.99999% certain it's the moon. I just have to put punch in because I've got about three minutes of video footage of this thing. I watched it for the whole way home. 
And the thing was this, was this weird hazy thing, and it almost looked like the color of the clouds that they were spraying. And if you look at the moon, you can tell what the moon looks like in normal conditions. It's very easy to see the freaking moon. But now, because they spray so much crap into the atmosphere some days, you look at the moon, and it doesn't even look like the moon anymore. It's all hazy and crap. I mean, it's just bizarre. I'll, I'll share this footage with you guys later. It was the, it, it's creepy. And I'm thinking to myself, imagine what happens if we get to a point where there's this huge planet that starts coming back. And we know, you guys, for a fact that there's dozens of trans-Neptunian objects, planets, potato, potato, same thing, that orbit our sun that will come back. Well, is this going to freak people out? I mean, if they see this huge planet in the atmosphere... Are they going to start having like neuro-linguistic programming breakdowns and not want to go to work and not want to do anything anymore because they just think the, the world's going to end and they think that this giant planet that's coming back is actually going to rip up the, you know, it's going to cause these earthquakes and it's going to cause these volcanoes to erupt and it's going to cause the atmosphere to be destroyed. What, what do you think? What, what would you do if you saw huge planets in the atmosphere that you weren't used to seeing based on all the doom that's been incorporated into the mindset for thousands of years. Whether you live or not, whether it destroys the planet or not, what would you do? What would your mindset do? So I'm thinking to myself, no wonder they're blasting the atmosphere if there's any way that the society is going to just collapse. People aren't going to go to work anymore because they're freaked out they're going to die, whether or not they are. What, what would you do if you were a, a government? Would you tell the people... Or would you, would you hide it from the people? I'd tell the people. I mean, if I, if I was in control, I'd be like, here you go. What are you going to do about it? Then maybe, if everybody knows about it, they could come together and come up with solutions. But no, it's those parasitic, narcissistic a-holes at the top levels that feel they have to control everything because they feel like they're God's chosen. Or they feel like they're God's. Or they just don't care. Maybe they feel like they're the devil. Whatever. They put some label on themselves to think that they're better than us. And they're going to come up with a solution. It's got to be their idea or no idea. They would rather see, some of these psychos would rather see the entire world destroyed if somebody else came up with a solution than themselves. Because they're that narcissistic. Welcome to the new, new world order. Who controls the world? Who? Who gets the most empires of dirt in this physical matrix, patrix construct that we're in right now. 